Uh, I'm Bill Perthes. I'm the Bernard C. Watson Director of Adult Education, and I've been asked to monitor this session. Um, I'll start with a question at the risk of oversimplifying these three remarkable pe uh, presentations. A theme of uh, the pers persistence of time seems to be one that uh, each of you uh, consider. And I wonder if, as you were listening to the other papers, you were thinking about how the, the, the idea of time resonates in different ways, obviously, with, uh, with each of you. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, definitely. That's the first, very first thing that I thought when you were, uh, and also the relationship with the desert and the searching. Uh, the words that we are both, that we are using are the same. It's interesting what you said that it's important, like uh, just not to universalize these words because they are very located. But it's interesting how the same words work to think to different uh, local things. Uh, in my case, my dissertation overall on this paper specifically, uh, the issue of temporality is very important uh, to uh, think about time in a non-chronological way in which things are just not one next to the other, but they are in connection to both the, the past and the building of the future. So that's why in my dissertation, both uh, decoloniality and memory studies are interlacing to, to each other. Um, I think that... Uh, Chronology is something that is related to the idea of forgetful in the case of uh, how neoliberalism is implemented in Chile and, and to reject that chronology, to, chronology, to uh, think about time in a more circular or uh, way is important to uh, think the present and the future at the same time in the specific case of Chile. Um, yeah, maybe you can comment in your... Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I feel like every time I go back to my work, I think about time in a different sort of way. Um, and recently I was thinking about, you know, that the word persistence specifically, um, you know, in the sense that for my work, uh, I feel like uh, this sort of simple presenting the work too much, uh, you know, over such a long period of time, uh, it, it's, it, it really um, hammers home that sense of persistence where, you uh, you know, you are screening the film, and at what point does exhibiting it um, become exposing it to vulnerabilities and things like that? Um, and I think that's interesting. I, I always think of the maneuver that Douglas Gordon makes as a very uh, mechanical one, one, one that is rigid, that is determined, that takes from, it simply expands the frame rate of the rules of film itself, uh, and I was thinking about uh, in in yours the the way the light uh, is it ninety second intervals. Um, you know, again, uh, that sense of this very rigid and a lot more conceivable kind of time frame, um, and the changes that I, I would imagine go on through that, where the silhouettes where at first they seem very uh, specific and individualized, then become glowing and harder to perceive and then affect the body and the shadows cast on the floor a lot more. And when that, you know, rotates at 90 second intervals, yeah, chrono chronological becomes suddenly serial and infinite. And, and I wonder if in a way that, uh, the way I think about the Tree of Life photo, which is something I feel like I see, I've, I've seen since, textbooks and early surveys, and I had that picture in my head. And to go from the Tree of Life to uh, the f photo of Mendieta on the log, um, where it clearly changes over time, she seems to become part of the log, which seems to attest to sort of uh, a harmony that's, that's uh, occurring over time. But then there's that gap between you know, she can't stay there forever. And the gap between that, the performance, and the archival aspect of us looking at the photos uh, and, and that reference I have, um, it seems to be sort of a, a jump there that I think is sort of interesting. Yeah, please. Um, is it on? OK. Uh, yeah, I, too, was struck by the similarities between this, particularly the extended performance and Gordon's um, 
video work in that for some reason, like stretching something out to a longer space of time um, makes the experience more active. You mentioned that in watching the video over a longer period of time, the audience is prompted to kind of um, internalize it more, or, um, contemplate it more, I think was the term you used. Um, and to me, that resonates a lot with Mendieta's um, attempt to kind of merge with the natural world by spending uh, a serious amount of time kind of in immediate contact with it. And I think time is so much um, a part of that work and a part of that process of the, the merger. Um, but I was also interested because Mendieta also works so much with memory, which I think relates to your um, presentation on Yara's work as well. Um, she's attempting to kind of um, resurface memories that she has of her homeland in Cuba and her kind of personal memories, but also kind of merge that with a larger um, cultural memory. She works a lot with um, pre-modern uh, cultures. She studies um, ancient Mayan religion and others. So I think she's interested in making connections between her time and those of um, and that of those that have come before her, um, which is an interesting conception of time as well. Uh, one other theme that seemed to resonate is that uh, each of these artists are interested in engaging their viewer in very sort of vis visceral and often physical ways of so the way that uh, Magneta is wants the viewer to imagine themselves in that in that position or the sort of retinal memory of Yar's memorial you know that even after it's gone it leaves that that imprint um, or obviously the spectator of Gordon's work out in the desert watching this almost interminable film um, and the you know the environment that would um, that would Im impact their uh, their experience. Um, yeah. So it, again, is that a, a theme that you think that each of these artists are um, you know sort of deeply engaged in trying to create create this direct connection with their viewers? Yeah. Uh, totally. Uh, sorry, before I was a little bit, it's weird to hear your voice. <laughs> so I was like hearing my right. voice. Yeah. yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> I'm hearing myself. <laughs> no, so I think that um, in the case of Alfredo, I think that it's important that he studied architecture instead of art. And he studied architecture in a specific school of architecture, which is the Universidad de Chile. And he studied with specific professors that were like in the creative branch of the school. And they, the idea was to learn about the space and the interaction with society by observation and in collectivity. He entered school in 1974. So it was just the first year after the coup. And the, the creative freedom that he had in the school was sort of like uh, so different than the um, punishment that was inhabiting you as a citizen in the dictatorial street. So he learned about uh, space and interaction in a, in a public space that was taught in which everything was prohibited. Uh, speech was prohibited. Uh, being out of your house after 8 p.m. was prohibited. But he learned how to see this uh, prohibited space uh, through uh, a collective thinking about that space. So that formation is important in his uh, later work. And I think what you mentioned is super important, the relationship between uh, time and light in Alfredo. Because he also studied filmmaking after studied architecture. And that's why also his relationship to art and his environment are so architectural and are so uh, connected to light to understand, understand time as well. So he divided his uh, art in three different phases. One is the creation of works, the other one is uh, um, conferences, and the other one is public space intervention. So for him, it's super important for him and for a lot of people in Latin America, actually, the connection with the viewer. And light is part of his, uh, uh, how he integrates the viewer in that sort of uncomfortable situation in which uh, after 90 minutes and 90 seconds, you just, just as photography is the same. You just don't see anything, and then that image, the idea is to uh, that, that the viewer had to keep that image 
in, in, in his or her thinking. So he's not, he's uh, inviting the viewer to think differently. That's why the geometry of consciousness, there's uh, an intention of intervening in uh, consciousness in epistemology, more than like uh, uh, the body, but through the uh, epistemic before and through light and, and time, yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the interesting things about Mendieta as um, kind of a performance artist is that she's, of course, not performing in front of a, a crowd or she doesn't have a lot of people around her except a couple of assistants to take the photographs. So it's quite different from both of your projects in that there's not really that sort of direct participation um, in terms of an audience. But um, I was intrigued when I found that statement because I, too, when looking at the works, felt sort of invited to like, kind of climb into them, um, especially the Silhouetto works. There's this amazing video that she did where she makes the Silhouetta and then sort of physically climbs into it and lays down in it. Um, and I think there's this sort of strange invitation for the body to occupy those spaces. Um, so it's, it's definitely um, a prompting for the viewer to, to be implicated in the work, but in a, in a different way than the kind of direct experience. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose at some point I sort of have to talk about the fact that for my work it's so, five-year drive-by would be so vast, it, it mostly exists as a proposed piece of uh, art uh, and, and not one that, you know, if it, if it is um, extant, it is, as we see up there in 2001, uh, that's the closest we've come because it's in a desert setting in California, um, but that doesn't happen often. And uh, so, you know, in, in that way, uh, at least personally, writing about uh, this work and uh, jumping between the work itself as an installation and uh, writing about the searchers as um, uh, reading the film as a text. Um, it, 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 for me, um, is sort of a very self, you know, for me as a viewer of art and um, a critic of art, I think it makes me self-reflective in the sense that um, I think of film as a very sort of fleeting phenomenological experience, um, one that maybe has more uh, more in common with conceptual art, as we talk about it, um, than, than film is usually written about. You know, usually when, when someone describes a sequence or something like that, it's as if it is set in stone, and of course we all watch things different ways, and things like that, and this sort of uh, opens that up. Um, and the other, the other thing is that um, this work uh, usually people know Douglas Gordon. It's for uh, his 1993 work, 24-Hour Psycho, which does a similar sort of maneuver, uh, slows Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho down to last a day. Um, but that's shown in galleries and fairly often. Uh, and so, uh, in a way, it's, uh, you know, the one thing that's missing is this sort of, spatial expansion into the not contrived space, you know, outside of the gallery into the world with light, you know, with, with light that is not controlled. And of course, that is the same thing that, um, you know, uh, uh, transforms the viewer to one watching a film to one outside and maybe a little frightened. <laughs> uh, other questions from the Thank you for those talks, those were great. Um, I have a question for Melanie. Um, what do you think that Mendieta might be saying about um, gender and about um, the sort of age old equation between the female body and nature? Um, you know, that's a sort of favorite theme in, in, in the history of art. Um, thank you for your question. I it was, <laughs> I knew I would get it. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because this work has been seen as kind of an example of more of an essentializing form of feminism that does equate women in particular as being inherently more connected to nature. 
Um, and I, I try in this work to really dispute that and to suggest that she does have a really sophisticated understanding of nature and um, the relationship between humans and nature. Um, and I, I can't say I've quite resolved how gender fits into that, but I would suggest perhaps that she is um, taking that cultural notion of women being closer to nature and, and suggesting it as a model for everyone, that, that, that this um, intimacy with nature is something that should be embraced by all human beings. Um, that's as far as I've gotten so far. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. This is for Florencia. Um, La Moneda. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, could you put the picture with the presidential palace and the, the smoke first, in front of the it? First the first one? La Moneda is the most, and I'm talking about issues of modern oblivion about this period. Mm -hmm. La Moneda is, in some ways, the most uh, iconic uh, representation of this period and of, this, uh, of the coup. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've worked a lot in it. In fact, just uh, in, in October, I did a photo survey of the inside. I was in there, and Pineda's wife was there and everything. It was, it was a bit frightening, actually, because you have to go under, underneath where the gendarmes pick you up and walk you through. But for me, it's a, it's a very important colonial building. It's, it's one of the two largest colonial-era buildings in Latin America. Mexico City Cathedral is the other one. So you know, it's important for me to study it. But I felt distinctly awkward working in there yeah. um, because the persistence of this memory still haunts it in a way. And when you go out in the front and there's all these Chilean tourists coming visiting it and, and there's all the police around making sure that they behave themselves, um, there's, no, there's no monument or there's no commentary about what happened in that iconic building. It's simply like visiting the White House, not the White House, like visiting uh, the Capitol. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just comment on that, what, what you think about that. Yeah, uh, totally. Um, La Moneda and the bombing of the coup is an iconic moment and an iconic image of dictatorships, not only in Chile, but in Latin America. It's the moment in which, and that, well, and those it also something important with photography that these images, a lot of images of La Moneda were also taken by international photographers that came to um, um, document Allende's revolution because Allende was the first democratically elected socialist, democratically elected ever president in the world. So there were a lot of international press in Chile at the time. And um, when La Moneda was bombed, uh, the, gov the, the military junta had its her headquarters in, um, in a building which is now the um, Centro Cultural Gabriela Mistral. Yeah. Yes. yes. And that yeah. was the building in which the Museum of Solidarity was, was held before. And there is a statue of Allende now there, and there is a lot of polemics also with that statue, uh, which is not in the very front. It's not in front. No, in fact, no. Well. It's not in the front. And as you said, um, the fact that, for instance, now the President Piñera wants to rename the Museum of Memory and Human Rights, he wants to rename it as the Museum of Democracy. So we, what we were talking before over lunch, that uh, they, there is a, an ongoing find that is so present in the daily political discourse in Chile about uh, fighting for memory and fighting for uh, deleting that memory. And that's very visible in the fact that that palace, which is the symbol of this catastrophic thing that is still affecting today's life, the feminist movement that is occurring right now in Chile, you see people with signs that are making reference to this moment today. And you see memory in public space protest, or for instance, in Jars Memorial, which is underground in the Museum of Memory, that mm. now they want to rename it as the Museum of Democracy, because democracy, according Case to the- Yes, and according to the government democracy, uh, that, that there is a lot of people from like military people or like that they also were suffering at the time. So it is conflictive to just uh, re, 
rethink concepts and rename super important buildings in order to forget. And what you were saying, I think, is, is, is key. The fact that there needs to be uh, a sort of monument there. There needs, there needs to be something. Um, but public space protests today, and maybe in your next trip to Chile, you're going to see uh, the, the feminist movement, what it's doing now. Mm -hmm. And they choose um, um, emblematic monuments such as, for instance, the Casa Central of Universidad Católica. It's an emblematic monument as well, so they go and protest over there. Uh, mm -hmm. They haven't, I think, created any protest in front of this museum, and that would be... This one? Yeah. Or La Moneda? That's all right, La Moneda. La, La Moneda. Moneda Museum. There is a no, museum. I don't think they get away with it. No, and there is a museum underneath, which is called the Centro yeah. Cultural Centro La Moneda. Cultura. Yes, yeah. but uh, although they do have... Uh, Exhibitions sometimes related to memory in a way it's much more traditional and conservative and yeah, yeah colonial art. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a, that's a great point. And it also struck me how clean that building is. It's amazing. It's so squeaky clean. Yeah. It's just erasing the whole memory. It's erasing everything. But the the, um, the balcony in which Allende uh, delivered his last speech is still there. Yeah. Like empty. Yeah. And yeah, you can still feel the phantoms of the past, but it's important. That's why memorial monuments are mobile and they recall the viewer, the viewer and the passerby, not specifically about the citizen. That that's still there because not only people still trying to find their disappeared, not because they think that they are there, because they want them to have a funeral. Because mm -hmm. they want like to have the right to bury them, because they just want to do that, because it's a right of life. But also the fact that education is a mess, like it's the, the legacies of the dictatorships are like inhabited every single aspect in today's society. Yeah. And and that's time again. And that's and I think that yeah it's super important to of course, continue thinking and continue thinking how these emblematic uh, monuments, as you said, um, play a pivotal role in how tourists come to Chile and don't see that. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. take their selfies in front of the Moneda, but Allende is back there. Yeah, 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 exactly. Allende is in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're almost out of time, but we have time. Somebody has a, one quick final question. Does that, do either of you have a quick question you'd like to ask? Okay, then I think we'll leave it there. Thank you all Thank very you. much.